Live from the MGM Grand Convention Center in Las Vegas, Nevada, it's The Q at Splunk.com 2014. Brought to you by headline sponsor, Splunk. Here are your hosts, John Furrier and Jeff Kelly. Hello, everyone. Welcome back. We are live in Las Vegas for the Splunk Conference. This is the Cube, our flagship program. We go out to the events and extract the signal from the noise. I'm John Furrier uh, with Jeff Kelly, the big data analyst at Wikibon, number one in the industry, uh, always putting out some great reports. Our next guest is Dave Fivash, Global Market Counterparty Risk Support Manager at BNP. Uh, welcome to the Cube. Thank you very much. Good so, to be here. Uh, one of the things that we were tweeting earlier in our crowd chat was uh, the, the AWS announcement that teases out the whole cloud play, which you know we get excited about because we love DevOps. We uh, you know we, we have our own cloud software, and we know all the amazing goodnesses that comes from that. So at the same time, it's a cultural shift. Yeah. So and, and when we were talking to the the product guys here at Splunk. It's funny, you know, Wall Street doesn't really understand yet, in my opinion, what Splunk is, <laughs> because it's such a modern, it's one of these modern companies that come by, and it's just like, okay, looks a little different until they have that continued performance. Mm -hmm. I don't think they'll, they'll truly understand it. But yet, you've got big data, you've got tooling, you've got a platform, it's pretty robust. Yep. But the cloud is really where the action is, so they're obviously moving to the cloud, a lot of their customers are. So, what's your take on that cultural shift, and is the technology in place to combine the on-premise goodness of data into the cloud? I think, it's, I think the cloud poses some really big problems uh, for the banking industry. It's security is their, is their key problem. Well, another key problem is always performance. Everybody wants to know they're getting the best performance for their money. And there is a very, uh, very strong opinion in many places that if I buy my, my piece of metal, then I know it's mine, I've got it, no one, I'm not sharing it with anybody else, I'm not losing to anybody else, in fact. Uh, and, and mutualized storage is, is, showing, is showing that problem where in a large enterprise you can find you have a performance hit from someone completely unrelated to you. So I, I think that clouds are, uh, they're, they're beginning to come in. I've, I know several banks that are using them, but they tend to be private. Yeah. And you have to have very, very strong metrology around that in order to ensure and to give your internal clients confidence that they're getting what they're paying for. Yeah, it's, it's, it's almost conflicting um, or fear on one hand and also promise on the other. Customers want what they want now. Yeah. Mobile apps are really important, so you got to have a mobile infrastructure because it's a client services issue. People yeah. want to have the best, latest and greatest user experience. At the same time, you don't have a perimeter in the cloud. So you don't really can't implement perimeter security in the data center these days because of the app. So it's kind of interesting, right? So we're in this dilemma. Okay, I want the best of today's modern apps, APIs, notifications, all that goodness, but I got to lock it up. Yep. So what's your take on that? I mean, it's, it's on everyone's agenda, it's on everyone's mind. What's your, what's your thoughts there? I mean, the banking highlights it is straight up because of the, of the data, the yep. money. It's like the bank. Well, it's, it's always been a worry, worry of mine that um, we, we put so much money into performance. You know, we buy the best hardware, we buy, uh, you know, we have great systems, and the internet in general, as, um, as Mark was saying just now in, in the, uh, in the key, security keynote, we're in this fetid miasma, as, as he said. And my worry is that with all of the security that we're having to, uh, we're having to see, it, and home PCs are a great example, the virus scanners, you know that your computer is, has got much more power than you're able to realize because you're having to weigh it down with all of that security. So, uh, and again, that's another reason why I think many, uh, many environments, they, especially banks, banks are relatively secure places, we all hope for our own savings and, and our yeah. security. And so they, they put a lot, of, a lot of infrastructure in place outside to ring fence what's inside. So it's classic trade-offs right yeah. now. So you, you, you mean you straight up, to. okay, you know, you want security, then you have to give up a little bit of that freedom yep. or elegance or in this case, you know, apps. Yeah. Um, so that's a so classic trade-off. Now roadmap, what's your take on the roadmap of, of, of that evolution? What's the vision from your standpoint of, you know, those table stake check box items, <laughs> check the box. It looks like, it's like on the airport going through security, you need to have those minimum things. But is there a roadmap in your mind that you see with DevOps 
with you know, agile programming, infrastructure as code, is it virtualization? Is it, you see some new tech that you like that gives you some hope and promise? I mean, certainly we're all in worryings there, but now there's a promise side. How do you address the, the, that roadmap? Well, I think there's, there's so much cool stuff now available in the virtualized world. Uh, especially in, in banking, you've never got enough systems. You, you always want to run lots of new tests. And I know that uh, you can find lots of cool tools like, like Delphix for virtualizing databases. There, there's all sorts of things that we can bring to the table inside the banking industry, inside the private cloud, which will enable us to scale out the hardware on demand. We can run tests, we can build test environments extremely quickly. And I think banks are going to really have to get to grips with the virtualization, understand it, feel comfortable with it. But I think with the, with the DevOps movement, you're also thinking about proving your security from day one and building that into your code and building that into your tests. And for those tests to pass automatically so that when the code gets deployed in hopefully a continual delivery environment that everything's already there, it's already proven. And you know, the financial industry, financial sector, if you will, in banking in particular, have been greaterly adopters of all the latest and greatest in terms of when it's reliable. Fast computers, all the speeds and feeds, um, big data certainly, arbitrage, you're looking at fraud detection, to so up and down, the benefits are there. Um, so with that being said, um, what's next? I mean, how much, how much more performance can you wring out of that? I mean, and, and, and what do you sh what would share with folks of things that you've learned? Because it's banking, banking and, and financial are early adopters on all the cutting edge stuff. Some say better than the government uh, in terms of uh, the, taking over the security because they, they have to put the, protect the money. But okay, for folks that aren't on the edge, like you guys are in terms of the latest and greatest, what advice would you have for other IT guys who are scratching their heads like, okay, I want security too, and I, I want to balance those trade-offs? Well, we found Splunk a great help for that because in the banking industry, you're finding that even your developers can hardly get onto the production system. One of the challenges we always have is developers are writing code, but they very rarely talk to an end user. That's where DevOps kind of comes in, bring the guys closer together, but then it's also very difficult for a developer to really understand how that application's performing in the live environment. If he can't get onto the machine, uh, typically, he won't have all the monitor same monitoring tools as, as the support guys, uh, but you can, ex you can extend that out very easily with Splunk. You can give them access to log files without giving them access to the host. You can build dashboards quickly and simply. They can see for themselves how they can extend their own logging so that to, to help Splunk. And when you, when you start putting that in front of your business users as well, they can start to see. So you, so you get them closer to the customer, closer to the front lines, yep. if you will. And two, you get them some data to play with. That's mm -hmm. almost like a development <coughs> source. It's like candy or a playground. Here, go play. And let them saute with that. It's, it's amazing how creative they can be sometimes. You know, I know developers spend all their day creating, create, creating new uh, wonderful solutions to problems. But when you put the, the data in front of them as well, then they start to see the value of that and we've seen that ourselves. Have you seen creativity come out of the engineers? Because normally they're looked at as guys in the back, banging away code. Uh, yeah, I mean, typically you're, you're feeding them Jira's and just getting new releases back. Hopefully they work first time. But no, we're, we're really seeing new ideas, especially with, with like the front end developers when we put Spunk in front of them. We started to get much more uh, rich logging yeah. coming out, so mm -hmm. able to leverage the power of Splunk, be able to understand. Uh, one, one example we had, uh, we got the front-end developers and the back-end developers, so we have a system where p traders can simulate a trade, do a what-if. Trader has a limit, he needs to know if the next deal is going to blow his limit or not. Now, this front-end would have problems. Every system does. Yeah. <laughs> and so, with getting the developers together with Splunk, they were able to, if, a, if an end user has a problem, they click a button and it gives you their session ID. They give us the session ID. We can now do a full front-to-back story of what went wrong. We can see the journey. How they got there. We see the journey all the way through from the front end, through its Tomcat nice. servers, back down into uh, the calculation engines, its whole journey through the calculation engines, and back out to the, to the client's desktop. And That's huge. Yeah, you do, all you do is just, and you don't even need to index equal, you can just put the session ID in and it, Splunk will give you everything very simply. So, uh, so, so you sort of answered the question I was about to ask, which was, does, does this require your developers to develop 
develop new skills, essentially around data analytics, uh, that, that maybe isn't in their sweet spot. But it sounds like Splunk lowers the barrier to manipulating and understanding data yeah. uh, in a way that maybe they don't, they don't have to become data scientists per se, but they can still understand, get what they need from the data. Is that Definitely. accurate? I mean, uh, because I think, I think when, once you open a window onto, onto this kind of uh, onto this kind of data, people start to think of new ways of using it, and if I can expose this, what else could I expose? Mm -hmm. uh, instead of write, you know, the typical way of, that a developer will uh, write their log files is often after the event, not just before I'm about to do something, so mm -hmm. it can make it pretty difficult for a support guy to work out what, what's not happening. <laughs> uh, but, but also, it's a, uh, I'm sorry, I lost that thread there. Uh, well, well, so let's expand a little bit on just the kind of the culture of this kind of data-driven decision making yeah. in application development. So, I mean, do you see this, um, are we just at the start of this kind of DevOps uh, movement, if you will? And what role are, are you know, tools like Splunk, but other, other tools as well that are making it easier, lowering the barriers for uh, people to actually start using data? How, how important is that going to become in terms of uh, the application developer um, role? I think one of the uh, one of the key problems I've found is is finding a hard, concrete definition of what DevOps is, mm -hmm. and and I think that that shows shows you how early we are in in the DevOps movement. Mm -hmm. Now I know that we've got DevOps days and we've got lots of things going on, people people getting involved, and I think a lot of us kind of know what DevOps is. You know, we've got the Phoenix Project book, it's a great book by Gene Kim and uh, amongst a few others. And you've got the, uh, the talks that, say, Jez Humble has, has put together at Velocity Conference, and uh, QCon have seen, seen some, some good talks there. But uh, and I, and I'm really looking forward to the, um, the DevOps cookbook coming out to really try and help provide this good foundation of information to, so you, you can go to senior management and really show them what, what DevOps is, with things that you're trying to instill. Mm -hmm. Because de DevOps needs to be a kind of top-down approach. You, 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 need, you need everyone at the top bought into the whole process because after all you're trying to build a new culture and you've got to really protect that culture because one, one of the problems is you can very easily under um, extreme pressure of tight deadlines for people to suddenly start going off into their, into their own retreating and not sharing what they're doing and not, not keeping everybody in the loop. So I, th I think we, that's, that's something that we really need to to look at is is how we can keep everybody together in the, in the DevOps culture. That's mm -hmm. one that's one of the challenges I think is it's not so much on the technologies and it's not so much on what we should be doing. It's keeping the discipline of of doing it. When when times are good, it's very easy to to do these kinds of things. Mm -hmm. But when times start getting really tough and you know you're maybe approaching a deadline and you know you've still got more days work to do than there is before the deadline then how do, you, how do you keep this going? Mm -hmm. And so part of that you mentioned is kind of getting that top-down buy-in. How do you, is it, is it easy to translate the benefits of DevOps to a higher level, you know, a C-level person who's not necessarily in the, in the trenches every day? Do they intuitively get it? Maybe they don't call it DevOps, but they understand the agility that's required to serve customers with applications that are, you know, that are uh, responsive to their needs? I, I, th I think when, when talking to senior management, you've really got to show them what the benefit is going to be for the client. Because ultimately, most senior managers, that's what they're focused on. They know that that's their reputation, that's their, that's their, their own image. When they, when they stand in front of their clients, they're going to be judged on what, what, they're, what they're receiving. So that, that, that's one of the main selling points. And, and for me, the, uh, the underpinning thing of DevOps is the inclusivity of everybody. It's getting everybody involved, everybody on the same page, everybody working towards a common goal. and. Uh, and under the old style model, say when, uh, in my own experience, we worked in, in financial institutions where the technology department is in a completely separate business environment, mm -hmm. you have two different agendas. You've got the, the client who wants the functionality, the technology group that wants to improve the technical architecture and make, make a, a more technically sound and along best practices kind of, kind of system. Uh, whereas if, if you're all together in one group, then everyone can have the conversations and understand, well, we can give you this functionality, but at the same time, we need to keep the road on the show by, mm -hmm. by, by building a sound underpinning mm -hmm. to all of this. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. So you can, you can have misalignment 
yeah. with the old model, where you've got, you basically got two different sets of goals for the two different groups for the IT and the business. And you, you're, inherently you're going to have tension in that model. Um, the collaboration model, the DevOps model, um, helps solve that problem, but as you said, actually one, one just kind of migrating to that model and getting everybody to change the way they've operated for so long, and then anytime you've got collaboration, you're going to, it, it could, could get messy. Yeah. So. Yeah, I think the way, the way we, we approached that was not to try and do it wholesale. Mm -hmm. It starts off with, with an individual project, a well-defined small project, and kind of prove how it could work there. Mm -hmm. So we, we, last year we put together a team that had members of the business, members of business analyst groups, the developers, support analysts, mm -hmm. all working together. And we, you know, we really saw the benefit there because mm -hmm. We, we had tight deadlines. We could see we were able to shorten the feedback loops, prove things were uh, were okay or not before mm -hmm. they went to the, the live environment. Whereas under old models, it's very easy to not have enough time to test and then end up with finding the problems in the more often in the live environment or at the time you're actually installing it, which is an even more worrying situation. <laughs> not ideal at all. <laughs> Dave, really appreciate you coming on. I'll give you the final word. Tell, uh, share with the folks out there, here at this event here, what's the most uh, impressive thing? What's the, or let me say this, what's, what's the theme? What's the vibe? Share with the folks who aren't here. What is this conference here about this year? Theme, mojo, um, just what's happening? I think this morning it was very exciting to see the, the different, uh, different use cases of Splunk. And, and what's coming up in the future, and it's, it's kind of underpinning the sort of things we've already been doing, doing ourselves, which is the analytics for everybody. And that's, that's the real thing that, that I've seen as exciting in, in our own int uh, brief introduction to Splunk over the past year, is how everybody is getting, um, everybody finds a use for it, whether it's a developer, a support chap, senior management, a business user, we've trained everybody in our department, how to use Splunk. Just very simply, it didn't take long, just an hour, about an hour to train them. And it's this idea of opening up all of your data to all of the people who should have access to it, obviously not just everybody, but opening it up to everybody and then allowing, allowing people to use that creativity and find, find new ways of slicing our own data. So yeah, I think, I mean, I think the analysts for everyone is awesome and I think your point about developers being part of this process because that has to, automation's got to come from somewhere. You got to abstract away the complexity. You got to write some code to do definitely, that. Definitely, definitely. And it's you know, so often developers can be seen as part of the problem, yeah. causing the problems. Yeah. Whereas now they're seen as as part of the solution, which is that's great for all of us. You know, I've been called a visionary, but I wrote a post in 2007 that said data is the new development kit, and I think that's definitely happening right now. Yeah. And you know, the, the, the people who put data in the hands of developers really drive that infrastructure as code. That's the future, uh, Splunk's going there. Really appreciate you coming on, and giving Thank the you. insights. You guys are on the cutting edge, and you got to be strong, relevant, and, and, and also secure. You got to trade off to protect the money and give the users great apps. <laughs> right? It's a tough challenge, you're worrying a lot, so, but it's a lot of promise. We're here inside the cube, breaking it all down. Jeff Kelly with myself, John Furrier. We'll be right back after this short break. <laughs>